I am in with my meat chickens today. We've changed around their brooder. We got them set up. We have about 80 meat chickens and another bunch of dual purpose egg laying and meat chicken breeds. This is incredible. These two chickens. Oh, easy buddy. Okay. Let's get a different quieter one. This is incredible. These two chickens are almost exactly the same age. This is a Cornish cross meat variety of chicken. This is a dual purpose egg laying meat chick that will grow almost as big as this guy, but it will take a lot longer. Today's video, we're going to talk about raising meat animals on your homestead, but very specifically, I'll put him down. He's just too loud. Very specifically, we're going to talk about raising meat on an urban or very small homestead where you might have to deal with certain legal restrictions, neighbors, how to raise meat livestock in a city homestead, urban homestead, small acreage area homestead. This is a video all for you out there who have small properties but want to grow your own meat. And I have some livestock you may have never considered on my list. I have about five different ideas for you. Let's get into it. This is Ask Home Study, the weekly show that we do here on our channel where we try to answer questions that you've left on our channel. Before I read the question, let me remind you, if you'd like to get us to answer one of your questions about anything to do with homesteading, all you have to do is ask the question in our videos with the hashtag, all one word, Ask Home Study. If you do that, I can find your question when I sit down to find the questions we're gonna answer for the week and then maybe you'll find we answer your question here on the channel. Today's question comes from Tiny Home Deals. Love your videos. We can't wait to find a small plot of land to put our tiny house on and start our homestead. I have a question for you and your viewers. We want to minimize the use of space while maximizing yield, taking in costs. So for our meat, geared for our family, we are thinking of rabbits and chickens. From your experience, would these be the better options? And then, Amanda adds in Ask Home Study, I have a similar question, especially with so many people joining because of the virus, could we have a show about how to get the most out of a small, maybe urban spaces? Where should we look to know about zoning and HOA or other groups that might limit what we can have? This might help people better know how to work with what they already have and encourage them to get started. So two great questions from Tiny Home Deals and Amanda Grout. So we're gonna to try to answer both those questions today. How to maximize for me on a small acreage. And we'll talk about zoning, HOA, neighbors, and how to make the best of that situation too. So let's get into it. Right now I'm hanging up a waterer for my chicks. We just redid the, the chick brooder setup and I'm working on getting them some nice clean water. I want to remind those of you who are watching who don't know our whole story. We have not always lived on a large acreage homestead. Our first homestead was 10 acres. And some of you just said, whoa, Aust, that is a large homestead. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. 10 acres is a very large homestead to a lot of people. A few of you think 10 acres is a small homestead. Most of you probably think 10 acres is a large homestead. But I'm not talking about our 10 acre homestead. What I'm actually referring to is our original homestead where we started this whole journey of trying to be more self-sufficient and get good meat for our family and vegetables. That's our apartment that we started off in uh, 10 years ago. 10 years ago we had an apartment, Kay had a small garden, I became a hunter. And so we know what it's like to have a limited space to try to feed your family from. Now I know a lot more than I did back then about livestock, meat animals, and if I had known then what I know now, I would have gotten started then raising some meat because you don't actually need much space for the next five and then we'll throw a bonus six livestock in there. Uh, you don't need a whole lot of space to do these animals, make them happy and feed your family. And a few of these, there's no way you will have any legal problems doing them. A couple of them you might have a little gray area. So let's get into small scale homestead, small urban homestead meat animals. First I gotta grab my drill. 
we, the first question Tiny Homes asked was about rabbits and chickens. And those are my first two picks for any small homestead looking to raise their own meat. Chickens is an obvious one. You don't need a huge amount of space to raise meat chickens, especially a chicken like this Cornish cross. If you raise this Cornish cross in a little coop and you let them outside into your little backyard every day, honestly, it doesn't matter. If you have a backyard that is more than, let's say 50 by 50, if you have a 50 by 50 backyard, that's enough for these Cornish cross chickens. You could have a batch of them, raise 10 of them, butcher them, raise 10 of them, butcher them, and they would be totally fine and totally happy. You could do it on half that space. Really, I mean, you could have a 10 by 10 backyard and raise these meat chickens. They're not a very athletic breed. They don't want to run around and do a lot. So if you provide them the food they need, you give them a nice coop and a little space where uh, they can get out and walk around and you can raise meat chickens. So they're a great place to start if you have any kind of outside space. Now the reason I lead with chickens is they're the easiest animal for meat to kind of get into and get out of if you decide it's not for you. I've talked about that in past episodes. Chances are, for a lot of you, you won't be allowed to do this. The sad truth is chickens have been targeted by HOAs, zoning officials, just all the awful, uh, I like what Jack Spierko of the Survival Podcast calls it, the department of making you sad. So any of those groups of people that like to make rules for other people and make their lives uh, less free, there's all kinds of people like that trying to stop you from having chickens. And you might be shocked. We almost moved to a town once where we had two acres of land we were looking at moving on to, and with two acres, we weren't allowed to have one chicken. That makes me like, livid to think of, that people think two acres, you shouldn't be allowed to have a chicken. It's not right, it's ridiculous, but anyway, you are where you are right now, and if there's regulations that don't allow you to have chickens, don't worry, we're gonna work around those and you're gonna get some meat animals, and there's nothing those department of making you sad people will be able to say about it. So let's go to the next one, which is rabbits, which we actually have here on this homestead. Let's go see some rabbits. I wanna show you our rabbit colony. This is an indoor livestock. The livestock in this room have never been outside and they don't need to be. You can raise rabbits indoors. In this barn stall, which if I paste it off real quick, one, two, three. Okay, in this 10 by 12 size space, we are raising meat rabbits. These are American Blues. They're not a giant meat breed, like uh, the Rex or the New Zealand, but they're very friendly. They do well in a colony setting like we've raised them in, and if you wanna learn more about that, watch more of our rabbit videos. This is a very small space, smaller than a garage. You could section off an area in a garage and do it like this, but people keep rabbits as pets inside their home all the time in like a bunny hutch. If you had one doe and one buck and a couple of bunny hutches, you could raise rabbits on your back porch. You could raise rabbits inside if you wanted to. You'd have to clean a lot, but people keep pet rabbits inside all the time. And rabbits are a great source of meat. One doe and one buck can have a litter like almost every single month. I'm gonna let this guy go because he's a little nervous. If you have two hutches, you can separate them so you don't get overpopulated with rabbits. We don't have that problem here of having limited space, so we just leave ours all together all the time. But in an urban environment where size was small, uh, the amount of room you had was just very, very limited, one doe, one buck, they'll have as many litters as you want to have, they'll just keep going. Great source of meat, ready to harvest in around 12 weeks, it, you can start harvesting them and it can be done indoors. One other pro about rabbits, their manure is awesome, awesome to put on your garden. So for making the most out of a small space, have a little raised bed garden, add the rabbit manure. Now we're getting more from our little small space. If there's laws you can't have chickens, there's probably not laws you can't have rabbits. And here's a bit of advice going to our second question about zoning issues. If the law says you can't have chickens, it doesn't mean you can't have ducks, it doesn't mean you can't have rabbits, it doesn't mean you can't have quail. Their laws, they made them. 
they can enforce the laws they didn't make. So if it just says chickens, don't assume it also means quail, because a quail is not a chicken, and that will not hold up. Get your quail. And if someone gives you a really hard time and you just totally are like, oh, you know what, I don't want to fight this fight, then butcher them and eat them. That's problem solved. Rabbits, animal number two. Now, let's, maybe you're like, you know what, rabbits are too dang cute and fluffy and cuddly. I, I don't want to have rabbits. Uh, I just can't butcher rabbits. Are there any other things we can do on our small urban homestead for livestock? Let's talk about another livestock that you may have considered maybe you haven't, let's talk about some other types of fowl that if the rules don't say you can't have them, then you can have them. Usually the laws concerning what livestock you can and can't have, the reason why chickens are usually so often uh, picked on in legal regulations is because of the noise of the rooster. Sometimes you'll find you can have some hens and nobody would even notice because they're very quiet, but roosters are loud. Drakes. <laughs> Come take a look at my drake. Did you hear that? The difference, I mean, you can see right there, my rooster, and that's quiet for the rooster. The drake, they just hiss. That's all they do. They don't make any noise. So if your legal laws say you cannot have chickens, that doesn't mean you can't have ducks. If the law says, you know, your house can't be painted pink on your street, it doesn't mean you can't paint your house red. The law is the law. Don't give them more power than what they have spent the time to do in their stupid legal regulations. Get ducks. We bought our Muscovy ducks from a guy who was raising ducks in town because there were rules he couldn't have chickens. So he started with ducks. Now, of course, that ruffled the feathers of those Department of Making You Sad people and they started trying to make it so he couldn't have ducks, but he still was able to have them. By the time we went and got him, he still had them. Now that was a fight that was ongoing and whatever. Well, let's not get into that. But the point is he had them because he could have them because he couldn't have chickens. So ducks are a great option if you can't have chickens. They will lay more eggs. They will give you more meat for less. They endure in better weather. The only reason we don't do more ducks here at our homestead is they are harder to butcher and I can't eat the meat or the eggs. I'm allergic to duck. So we only have two because we got them before we knew that and we like them so we keep them around. But there's a great option. Now I'm gonna throw in this category. No, I'm not, Se separate category, new animal. Muscovies are a great animal duck. Uh, you can get other like peeking ducks. Muscovies are good because they don't need a whole lot of water and they don't make a big mess. But you can get peeking meat ducks. Let's talk about another kind of fowl that you can do indoors. This one, if you have the right setup, the right cages to raise them in, quail. Quail can turn meat really, really quickly. They can turn eggs really, really quickly. Meat and eggs from quail in quail cages inside of a garage. I've seen people with whole systems set up in their garage. They are turning meat and eggs like crazy. Quail. Look into it, awesome solution for small acreage, small homestead, urban area where you know people are looking, nosing around like, oh, what are you up to? They can't come in your garage. Zoning officials, okay, here's something to remember. You don't have to let them in. Okay, on to the next thing. Uh, another great animal uh, for meat that you've probably never thought of, pigeons. What, gross, I don't wanna eat a pigeon, don't. Don't think of pigeons as gross. Pigeons are like any other bird. They're out, my chickens are out all day pecking all kinds of stuff and turning it into farm fresh eggs and meat. Pigeons are a great option. Pigeons could be one of the best options for a smaller urban homestead because you can teach pigeons to go and then come home. You can teach them to be homing pigeons. Now I've never had pigeons, but actually Kay's aunts used to have pigeons and she used to train them to they could fly away and then they, they're homing pigeons. They would come home. Pigeons are used for meat. Squab, that's what squab is. It's pigeon. 
you could have these pigeons, you can go and catch them from urban areas, under bridges, you know, buildings, put a pigeon trap out, catch them, bring them to your homestead, train them that that's their home now, then open up the door, they'd go out, they'd fly around town eating whatever they wanted to out around town. You wouldn't even have to hardly feed them, but they would come home and when you're ready to butcher a pigeon, you pick a big fat pigeon and you got meat on the table. You would need like no amount of room for pigeons. Nobody's gonna be able to come and say, hey, you're keeping pigeons. Pigeons go where they want. So have some pigeons, use them for meat. I, you probably never thought of that one, but look into it. It's a great option for someone who's really motivated right now to have their own meat, but is limited in what they can do legally. Now let's look at another area that's gonna get past almost all regulation. Fish. You could set up a couple of ponds, or and when I say ponds, I'm using the term very, very loosely. I mean like you could literally, you could literally take a couple of stock tanks and raise fish. And I don't just mean fish like you see tilapia that are being, you know, sold as a, a farm or homestead fish. There's no reason you couldn't go down to whatever local pond you have and catch some bluegill or sunnies or whatever's out there and put them in your stock tank. And better than just doing fish, do an aquaponic system. Set up a system where you're growing fish and on top of the fish, you're growing plants. And now in one little area, you have plants and fish. The fish are, are feeding the plants, you feed the fish. Awesome way to maximize production. It could be done indoors, it could be done outdoors. Fish are an awesome meat source. There's gonna be no regulations that keep you from somehow raising fish. Maybe there's regulations on putting up actual dirt pond in your backyard, but that doesn't mean you can't have a couple stock tanks hooked up to a pump, doing an aquaponic system, a couple of fish in the, in the tank. Okay, I think I'm ready to hang my water now. I just moved everything, so it's all, it's all in different spots. Here's a little tip for any of you out there who are raising meat animals right now. I'll put a link below to this. This is a painter's tray, and these are roller trays that come with painter's trays. You can buy these on Amazon. I bought mine on Amazon. They go right into this painter's tray. It creates a little thing for the chicks to stand on and drink, but all the nipple water drippings that normally would get in your shavings and make this really dirty and nasty really fast get in the tray. Once a day, you take this guy and you dump it in a garbage can, and then you put this back on underneath your waterer. It works best with a nipple waterer, but you can use it uh, for a bell waterer. You can use it for any kind of chick waterer. And I always hang my waterers from like a pole strap like that. So as the chicks get older, all I have to do is pull on this and it gets higher and higher and it always stays right above our catch pan there so it catches all the drippings. It helps keep the water clean and it helps keep your stall clean. You have to change out shavings a lot less. It just makes for a really nice system. I gotta fill that water, it's almost empty. I'm gonna give you a bonus one. Ooh, a little too close there. Give me a little personal space here. I'm gonna give you a bonus one. This is not for me, but it is a livestock you can do in an urban environment, in a small environment. Bees. Bees are a great source of food, honey. Gonna be great for that garden that you do in a raised bed or in a you know small scale aquaponic system. Still need some pollinators depending on what you're growing and how. But anyway, uh, the point is, yeah, have a little beehive. I once asked a beekeeper uh, how much space you need around the beehive so that, you know, people don't get stung. He said, like, do I want to have a beehive really close to like my kid's swing set? He told me a story uh, that a woman came to his house where he was raising bees and she was asking him a bunch of questions about the bees and she was worried about the bees. She's like, well, you know, I'm your neighbor and aren't the bees gonna get into my property and sting me? 
And he goes, have you been stung since you've been talking to me? They're on the front step of the house. And she says, well, no. And he goes, well, look. And she looks right down, right next to his front door. He has a beehive. And uh, the bees are going in and out, and the lady wasn't stung. So the point is, I, I wouldn't put one personally by my front door, but you can do bees on a smaller size area, and you won't have problems with them. They're not going to, like, swarm your house. So there are some great livestock ideas for you on small scale urban environments. Now let's talk about how to find out whether or not you're allowed to, zoning, HOA, where do you look to find these things out, and how do you work around it? In a minute, I'm gonna talk about one of the most disappointing things that can happen to you on your homesteading journey and how to avoid it. it has to do with legal regulations. But first, it's time to do the Homesteading Camel Train. Shout out! Today's shout out goes to Lori from Arizona. Lori says she doesn't have a homestead and she may never be able to. But spoiler alert, I think you have a homestead, Lori. She is on disability and she's going through kidney dialysis. She's been through the last 27 years. So Lori has some serious setbacks. She grew up on a dairy farm and she's always loved to grow things. And here's why I think Lori actually does have a homestead. Maybe she doesn't have the homestead she wishes she could, but listen to what she's doing on her tiny space, which is what this video is all about. She has eight garden beds in her not big backyard. She's growing fruit in pots because she has a lack of ground space. She puts them in pots. She has berry bushes, blueberries, blackberries, all potted plants. She's designed her backyard landscape to be friendly to bees, hummingbirds, birds. She even put in a milkweed bush and now she has monarch butterflies coming to her property. That sounds like a beautiful little homestead, Lori. I know you don't have the one that you wish you could like that dairy farm you grew up on, but you are so such an encouraging example doing as much as you can on that little space, which is what this little which is what this video is all about. Thanks for sponsoring this video, Lori. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you for joining the camel train. Now let's get back to talking about how to do it on tiny spaces like Lori is and one of the most disappointing things that can happen. So one of the most disappointing things that I ever hear about in my email inbox doing this show, people will write you emails and stuff. This is like the saddest thing that happens. They learn about homesteading, they get excited to try it, they go out, they get themselves some chickens or some goats, or even some little piggies. And they get everything they need all ready for their animals and they get them all set up perfect. And they bring their animals home and they set them up and they spend time with them and they love them. They're so excited. And then the town official shows up and tells them they can't have pigs because there's a zoning rule that says you can't have pigs if your na nearest neighbor is 300 feet or less. So how do you make sure that doesn't happen? And by the way, pigs is another one. I used to raise two pigs in a 16 by 16 square. They were totally happy. We gave them all kinds of scraps and fun stuff to play with and they had a nice little house and water and food. You don't need a lot of room for pigs, so there's another bonus one. How do you make sure you don't get disappointed by the department of making you sad? The trick is you gotta look in multiple places. If you have an HOA that you live in, that stinks. But you chose to live there and so you chose to live by their covenant. So look at the covenant rules and see what does it say you can and can't have. And remember, a duck is not a chicken. So if it says you can't have chickens, don't say, well, that means I can't have ducks. No, it means you can't have chickens. Can you have a dog? Okay, then you can have a duck. The same rule applies to your local town rules. And in the United States, usually you'll find these town regulations at your zoning office, your health department, your building department. Now, each one of them will affect different things. So your building department will actually tell you where you can build your barn or your sheds or whatever structures you're gonna build to keep your animals in. So that's where you look for that. Your health department will tell you you're not allowed to have pigs because you're located near a restaurant or something like that. Zoning will tell you this town doesn't allow pigs at all because this town is a bunch of cranky, curmudgeon -y people who think pigs are stinky and you shouldn't have stinky animals on your property. I have very little patience for town regulation that limits how much food you can grow. 
And if you live in a town, I'm not saying disobey the rules, you absolutely should obey those rules. If you move to that town and there are the rules, you have to obey them because they can make your life difficult if you are disobeying the rules. If you're not, you don't have to let those zoning officials onto your property unless they have a signed order by a judge. I'm not a legal, this is not legal advice, I'm just letting you know when I used to work in excavation we worked with a lot of zoning officials and that's what I was always told. To, you don't have to let them on your property unless they have a signed judge signed piece of paper. So, but don't break the rules. Find out exactly to a T what the rules are and then work around them. Don't break the rules. And the best thing you can do is say, you know what? This town is a bunch of curmudgeony people who hate pigs and chickens. Move out. Don't give them your tax money. Don't support that town. Find a place that lets you have the life that you want. I know not all of you can do that right away, so start building towards that. If you live in the curmudgeony town that doesn't allow chickens, get yourself some ducks and start saving your money so you can move the heck out of that curmudgeon fest town and you can wind up in a place that lets you have things like pigs, which are so wonderful and really don't need a lot of space for. If you enjoyed this episode and you're really thinking about getting livestock and you don't know how to get started or where to get started, we have a free course for you. Click right there, you'll sign up to our email list. I will send you an invitation to take a five minute survey after which you get access to the six hour video course all about getting started homesteading. The second lesson is all about raising livestock, how to pick the right ones for you, how much to get at first. You're gonna love it, it's totally free. Click there to get it, and we'll see you in tomorrow's video.